And can we also say thank you to Electronic Frontiers Georgia? Yes. Yes. Okay, go ahead and uh, introduce yourselves. All right, I'll go first. Okay. So, hi, I'm Haley Tsukayama. I'm Associate Director of Legislative Activism at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, in my work, I focus a lot on state-level legislation all across the country on a number of EFF issues, including privacy, which is sort of the issue of my heart. Um, and uh, I also, uh, I co-lead our internal consumer privacy working group. So, thinking a lot about data collection and use. Hi, I'm Chuck Delosier. I sometimes act as the community outreach coordinator for Electronic Frontiers Georgia. We are a state-based civil liberties interested digital rights activist group. Uh, we have been active for the last you know, five, six years uh, going to the Capitol and lobbying as citizens. We are not a formal uh, charity in terms of like 501c3, but we are a very diverse group of individuals that um, are looking to see how Georgia law is made, and we hope to be advocating for more in the future, including right to repair. Um, and with that, I will start off and say that um, I'm concerned about the different types of technology that people are having to be uh, involved with interacting in their homes and their apartment, or what we would call multifamily uh, housing communities, which could be a condominium, it could be an apartment complex, even some hotels nowadays that have kind of blended, whether they do a short-term rental or not, could be um, involved with this. And um, I thought we would start today and talk just about, and maybe get a show of hands, um, so we can have some definitions on some of the things that are affecting people. So if I could ask you, um, let's start with door locks. Um, how many people here at their home or their apartment or their condo or wherever you're staying um, have to deal with a keyless entry or a smart lock? Does anybody here have that where they live? Okay, I've had that before, <laughs> so I'm raising my hand. <laughs> remind if it's dual, we have the electronic and we also have. That is correct. I was going to define that. So keyless entry is usually like what you do when you're going to your car. That's one example. It's usually by radio, like a button or something like that. Um, and, you know, like I've actually been in cars before where you have um, to leave the key. I usually sit it in the middle somewhere, you know, like because if you can't, if you don't have the key in the car, you can't lock it or unlock it. Um, and then the smart lock is a microcomputer. So the smart lock could be app based um, and you're going to need to activate something in order for you to unlock. Um, but again, I do live in a place where I'd use that. So that's, that's one thing that's interesting. Um, how many people live in a place where your utilities are internet connected, uh, which would be like a smart meter, your utility thermostat uh, for gas or electric or things like that? Okay, a few people. That's interesting. I haven't lived with that one yet, and I'm a little nervous about that. Um, but uh, I might not be nervous about it, perhaps, if it were on the control of my home. But if I were moving into an apartment complex, I might have a few more concerns about that because I wouldn't have a choice. Okay, how about cameras that would be used for facial recognition or for your entryways if you're in multifamily housing, for instance, going in and out of a pedestrian gate or going in and out of uh, a, a parking garage, for instance, sometimes would use uh, cameras to log who's coming and going. Does anybody live where that is? That's probably a lot of people. I know I do. Uh, phone apps. How many people live where they actually are acting, uh, interacting with entering and exiting their properties using the app for uh, your community? I resisted that. I, I'll tell that story. Uh, but that was only because I was going to leave that I got out of it, that I didn't have to do it. I wasn't going to renew my lease, so I didn't have to do it. Otherwise, I think they would have kind of forced me into it. Um, and then there's kind of the multitude of all these other things that are happening uh, to people. Uh, package delivery, a lot of us have locker systems now where we live, uh, which draws in some data where you know you have to enter either a credit card or a sequence of numbers or something that would identify and tie you to being able to get that but also what happens to that data um, even pet data that was one that pushed me over the line where I left um, 
they had, if, you, if I had renewed my lease, whether or not I had a pet, I would have had to have um, acknowledged their policies electronically. And if I did have pets, then I would have to register them. And, it, and a couple of different com companies have uh, different levels of invasiveness, at least in my opinion. It's like not that you just had that dog and that breed, which I think a lot of us are concerned with now. I mean, we've seen it, you know. We don't want the, the dog to be bitten but we are biting us, but we don't want to be you know the other end of it we don't want the one that we live with and love to not be accepted but this was actually pushing it further to where what vet did you go to what vaccinations and you keep having to update it with them so that was a little that was a little bit much for me uh, has anybody else done that in their community well it is oh you have that yeah. that exists in atlanta uh yeah. I've, I've had to uh now go with it yep they do oh, yeah. they do they do um that gives you an overview of like there's probably more and if you know of more things i'd like to know what you say after this or and question and answer because i want to collect as much information about how many things <laughs> there are going on so that we can look about all this interconnectivity and data collection yeah and i think you know one so thank you for that rundown because i think that's like a really important certainly the the last you probably saw i raised my hand a lot the last apartment i moved into we just moved in about a year ago it's a great location, da, 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 da. but when we moved in, I realized, oh my gosh, I have to download five apps to live here, <laughs> right? Um, there's the smart lock, there's the package delivery, there's the, the, you know, the garage, there's all this stuff. And so um, I think increasingly, and you know, embarrassingly, I do this for a living, right? I'm a privacy advocate. Um, <laughs> but I think increasingly we're seeing uh, project management companies really come in and say in their buildings, like, yeah, we'll have a contract on that. We'll have a contract on that. And it's very difficult, I think, for tenants to both understand um, what's coming, you know, what they're signing up for when they're signing a lease. And then um, certainly to interrogate the privacy policies or the, the data use and collection of, of all of those services that are coming in into really what was you know a, used to be a fairly simple um, space so that is that is a thing that we're talking about today. I have not experienced that many apps <laughs> I'm resistant to that as much as I can be um, I'm not comfortable with it but you did touch on something that is near and dear to my heart that made me start I actually had been uncomfortable with this before the pandemic but during the pandemic when I had a little bit more time I would and and during the pandemic uh, where I was living, we had management changes and management changes meant other service providers were coming along with them. And I noticed in the scare of how would it affect people? Um, and it legitimately, there was a scare. Breathing was at one point very, very dangerous. And so, um, you know, uh, people were looking for touchless ways to do things. But what I was seeing was there were deals being done uh, where a vendor that would have, for instance, a, a package system for, or the locker system um, would approach the real estate firm that might own many properties and they would do a vendor driven deal as to we'll provide these to you, we'll even subsidize these. Um, and that's where I started doing my research because I said, well, how can I find out, like, what kind of a cut is this? Like, how much. Uh, because ultimately, because they were taking up parking spaces in order to place something, uh, rent, in a sense, would be being paid because you're using their real estate. They're not giving away anything on property for free. Um, and also, there might be liability questions. So that's how I started to get interested in, like, what is all of this like? Because I'm not a, saying that you should not be having a great product and making money by any means. I just wanted to understand, how is that working? Because uh, everything I noticed was being rolled out with larger uh, real estate uh, developed you know, development firms like the ones that we could name here that we see in the Atlanta metro area but they exist in many different states those conglomerates were if you find a solution that seems like it's going to work for you and there's some profits then you're apt to roll that out and um, it just hit home with me like that's the kind of deal where citizens don't get to be um, 
they don't get as much input in that. Mm -hmm. And you couple that with the fact that everybody in America now in a city says that we can't afford to live here, no matter where you came in at whatever level, that was like the perfect storm to me of you're being priced out of wherever you are. That's not a good feeling. It doesn't, everybody wants to do better, but if you can't be where you were, you already are having to you know, figure out what else to do. And then you are being forced if you're not able to get into the housing market to have private property, then you're forced by de, fact, de facto of being a part of something that you might not have chosen, you know, on your own. That's, that, that part bothered me. There's enough people that would not have a, a choice. Now, where I lived, I was in DeKalb County here for a while, and I was near Emory University. So our audience of people would be different than some neighborhoods more transient in the sense that they're going to graduate, they'll move on. But then I began to think, well, what is going to happen when it's adopted and they have things that people that, you know, want to roll something out get, which are statistics of how successful this has been. And then they, you know, the price comes down, you know, and the solution that they offer. And then it rolls out into uh, communities where people um, might not be quite as transient. They might not have the money to move as easily. And what happens to that group of people, whoever they are? You can define that. It's kind of a moving line, of course, as to like who is in that group, but it's a group that doesn't have the means to travel as easily. And then what rights would possibly be violated or just how, what input would they have in their community even um, where they, might not ever be in a housing uh, a private private land situation. That was easy for me because I've always kind of been of modest means in my income. I had kind of <laughs> negotiated for myself. I wasn't going to be a homeowner probably. Like uh, there's a lot of people in the United States that can understand that sentiment. And I took it on the chin and I was like, okay, well that wasn't really the way I thought about it when I was 20 something. But if that's true, I'll find a really nice place to be, except the really nice place to be is becoming a surveillance state. And I thought, well, there's a lot of people, because I was paying kind of average rent. It was, you know, wasn't $2,000, but it wasn't 900. I mean, it was like in the middle, you know what I'm saying? And so I thought, but well, if that happens to me and a lot of other people, then do how, why do we have to be forced to live like this? And I'm going on a little bit, but I just wanted to say, like, that's my two takes on my personal, like, how I was even interested in this in the first place. Yeah, well, and I mean, I think your personal experience really underscores a lot of concerns that we have about a lot of this technology, right? You brought up some really good points. I think, you know, EFF, we're always trying to think about user autonomy, about individual choice, right? And making sure that, for example, privacy rights are applied equally. And really what is being set up here when landlords are making the decisions for all the tenants in their building, for example, um, is that you are taking away individual choice of what people have in their own homes. Um, and not everyone, of course, can afford to buy a home. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. I will never own a home, let's be honest. Um, and so if people want to make decisions about what smart devices they put in their own homes, you know, you can make those trade-offs, you can decide what you're going to install and what you're not going to install. But if your building demands it and you have to go find another building or, you know, you have to have a long protracted fight with your landlord over, for example, if you can have a, a non-smart lock in your apartment, then that is a very different, um, that's a very different kind of scenario that you're put in. That's a very different sort of power dynamic that you're put in. Um, and I, you know, I would really, um, it makes me very nervous um, that it really, um, puts more data collection and use onto people who can't afford, right? We, privacy should not be a right that you have to pay for. And so it makes me very nervous to say, okay, we're looking at the rental market. Um, you know, these are people who can't buy homes um, to say that they're subject to more data collection, that that is part of the price of living in a, in a building is very, very concerning to me. Agreed. How much time do we have to continue with the we're at 240. Building, building the rant. Okay. <laughs> so, um, well, I, I, I don't have this in a particular order, but I do think that uh, fairness and accessibility are two of the main issues that would be, you know, on the minds of anybody if they thought about it and then we're busy so we don't until it happens to us, you know? Um, so, 
that brings us into the data collection more in terms of like the way we have to fill out our leases. This is also a part of it. It's a little bit different type of surveillance, if you will. It goes more into data collection, um, but we don't get paid for that and we're just giving it away and um, people are compiling uh, demographic information about us when uh, and, 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 and then using it and it will show up in the kinds of communities that are being built and we're not getting to have as much input into that. And I think the reason that that should be concerning and that I am advocating for everybody to think about that more is the fact that if it's true that housing affordability isn't going to be solved because we even have a mayor here in Atlanta uh, who has uh, spoken about needing to be more strict in his narrative about the range. What does affordability mean? Like when you say that word, it sounds good, doesn't it? We want affordable housing, except when you see the number and it's not really like quite what you had in mind for what affordable was and that was a positive step that the mayor started talking about that I think a little bit um, but the point is um, it's not it, it these things with with data collection go into specialty credit reporting mm -hmm. uh, systems that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with but it's certainly if you're not as familiar more than the big three that you would get your annual credit report dot com from there's a lot of products that are out there and if you've got a market uh, and you want to sell something in there's somebody else who's probably going to have a credit report that will be generated or if they haven't they might they'll, they'll start that business because there's a lot of them now nowadays um, rent bureau is one there are several listed uh, I know that one because that is something that is here in the Atlanta community uh, I think Amrent is here uh, in the Atlanta community. I don't, I didn't ask to see where everybody is from, but the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has a very good list uh, nationally of the ones that are used. And so you have to be careful when we're giving all of this data away that you, you do the right things and that the algorithm likes you because you might get blacklisted in some way and not know about it until uh, you try to move forward. Um, that part uh, is is very concerning because when the communities have decided by doing a vendor driven uh, purchase of, of of whatever it is that they're collecting by app uh, I mean where I was living uh, there was a lot of volunteerism and in information uh, that you could fill out a profile as much as you wanted or as little as you wanted but nonetheless it was a profile that you were providing and uh, most people don't think about it and what are you going to do when you leave? Are you going to delete that? Do you have the right to delete that? How long do they keep it? Those kind of things are important. Yeah. And I think, you know, we're, we've talked about, you know, sort of the, the, the deals, the vendors that come in and the, and you know, the ways that landlords are, they have, they are able to sell that data. Not that they should, but they are able to. Um, and then also there's a way, there are kind of the way that it, that it comes back around is that they're also using this information to create kind of tenant profiles as you were talking about. So they're using uh, tenant screening um, systems. So, you know, often you may find uh, it's harder to find an apartment and that could be because you've been put into, you know, have a low score in one of these tenant screening things. And, um, you know, it gets a lot into sort of what we talk about in general data privacy. Like uh, I read an article about this gentleman who was denied, uh, denied a, a denied an apartment because he had a low score that he found out later was based on a past conviction for littering. Um, and so it's like he had this past conviction for littering and that affected his ability to get housing in the future, which is probably something you would never ever put together. Um, and that sure there's would. very little transparency into it. And, um, and certainly uh, not all records are perfect. And so if you have to go in and correct information or something, how would you even know? That's, a, that's super. That's exactly right, because I'm personally doing that right now just to be sure of my situation. I'm not so worried about what the specialty credit report will say as much as if I see an error, um, how long it takes to correct that, because that might affect me in the future. And that part, um, you know, I mean, it's not, it's not fast necessarily um, for that to happen. Yep. Yeah. And also for private homeowners, I. Um, people who live in a house and they opt to have a camera system or whatever they do for their own security. Excellent idea if that's what you want to do. 
I'd like for us to think a little bit more about the people that we hire to work there, the domestic workers, the people that are in and out of our homes all of the time working, um, may in fact not feel comfortable in speaking up about things that they're uncomfortable with. I mean, I, I think it's, it, I think when we continue to migrate into this era of uh, safety is important and security is important, but if you have the ability to hire someone to work in your home as a personal assistant or as a housekeeper or however you would characterize that job description on your private property we should also be thinking about the people that are working for us and what what would what their lives are like and how they would be interacting Let's see. We've spent quite a bit of time um, talking about things that concern us. Uh, do we want to talk a little bit about what folks can do or what ways they can do more research? Or uh, Sure. Yeah? Yeah. What can you do? Uh, around here? You go first. <laughs> no, you go okay. ahead. Uh, so in Georgia, I know that I have contacted Metro Fair Housing. Now, most people will think about Metro Fair Housing if you've heard them on um, – WRFG, Radio Free Georgia, uh, advertises them, or they have in the past. Um, They're a housing uh, advocacy organization for housing discrimination a lot of times, and they encourage people to contact them. But uh, they and the Housing Justice League here are looking at affordability. Um, But I have seen that people here are looking into the – what how surveillance is being used in their communities as well. It is not simply because you were denied housing, um, because they understand that the world is changing. So they're looking at that. Um, And uh, I have moved. I don't live here any longer now, but I'm trying to stay abreast of what's happening. Those are two, as I said before, um, checking your credit reports uh, and letting, letting people know in your community uh, whether it's your manager or your uh, HOA, if you're in a condominium situation, something that's uh, where you would have an HOA, uh, letting them know how you feel about that and making sure that you, uh, well, I could actually throw that to you. Uh, there may be some guidance from people that are fantastic, like the Electronic Frontier <laughs> Foundation. Uh, in terms of uh, what could you do to supplement your uh the authorities that you would have in an HOA contract situation with people like how where would people find good language that would say well we would like the right to delete this or those kind of things yeah I mean I think um, you know as I kind of referenced earlier I think a lot of what we're talking about here there are it it, it falls in line with what we want for general consumer data privacy okay I I was just gonna say I just made that up as I because I was like that's what I would be doing (laughs) (laughs) we need some guidance here (laughs) so specifically on smart locks for example EFF has we have a blog post about smart locks and we say you know we want an option for uh, like a traditional lock so option for an analog um, Option. Um, you want consent for, you want to see if you can get consent for processing. So um, even if they collect it, you know, how are they using it? You have to ask me first. Um, the data minimization, they shouldn't collect more information than they need. Um, and uh, particularly with smart locks entry and exit, you know, we're thinking also about, because the EFF, we're thinking about um, interaction with law enforcement. So are you turning over that information without a warrant? Um, we would like a warrant requirement. And then also there's a security component, right? I mean, I think in a lot of cases, um, some of these vendors, we're not sure, you know, how secure they are keeping their data. We're not sure how secure the landlords are keeping data. So just sort of putting in minimum requirements for what kind of security you want to see. So those are some recommendations. Excellent. Uh, I would encourage anybody who's interested in getting involved in this type of work, uh, which is advocacy is work. It means you have to do it all the time. Uh, The Housing Justice League has had uh, several events. Had I not been already needing to relocate, Uh, I would have attended just to make sure I could network with some more people and know more about what was going on right here in the in the metro community Um, if you want to do work for yourself um, the privacy rights clearinghouse is a very good website that has um, information that talks about everything about data collection um, to it also like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau will list um, different uh, consumer specialty consumer uh, credit reporting agencies that you can write off to they're legit um, they're not um, 
uh, I would personally and have only gone through something like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau as a government agency for sourcing something uh, like that. Uh, you d Before that, the Privacy, Privacy Rights Clearinghouse? Yes, and if you... Uh, if you type that in, it will it will come up that way. I'm almost certain. If it doesn't, I'll look it up and see what I have. But that's <laughs> that's the name. I'm pretty sure that it will say it that way. Um, and also, uh, meeting your if if you want to go past what you personally can do to check and protect yourself, like by getting your own credit reports, also going to uh, the mayor. The mayor's office is always good to talk to. Um, Maybe more effectively, because the mayor has to speak to a different in a different way, uh, the city council, your city council and your county commissioners um, about housing are a good uh, good idea. And meeting your um, state house representative and your state senator are also very, very good ideas and letting them know your concerns about affordability and the other issues. Um, I have spoken to mine here about. Uh, fairness and equity in e-leasing and things like that. They, they are more um, adopted than ever before. Um, I think people assume that that e-lease or e-payment is protected in law like it was on paper. I'm not 100%. I am not an attorney. Um, Nor am I. <laughs> but I am not certain that it is as protected. I'm not sure. But I do know that when I have to fill out an initial 30 pages, which you would do in a housing you know, situation today, and you continue to push a button, maybe it's a little bit more important sometimes than the terms of service that we will kind of breeze through in just a website that we wanted to go to or something because if something doesn't work out right then you might have should read and and they will definitely tell you did you read that if it really were to come down to it and i'm a little bit uncomfortable about that because i don't know that everybody has um, accessibility to a computer and if you've ever walked up to one and you've not seen it before even if you've been working on them for 10 or 15 years everyone's a little bit different and when you're signing a lease it might be important to be familiar with the device if they say well we've got one for you so I mean I, I'm not um, I like the option that people can read something and and um, and and see that and then go back it's kind of like TV to me TV continues to go if you don't like what I've just said, you can always stop me and then I can repeat it and then you can make sure you heard it. And you can do that on a piece of paper too by rereading something and you can't do that at TV and le except for that thing that they have or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also think, so, uh, sorry, uh, there's this kind of whole area of technology uh, often is referred to as prop tech or property technology. Um, and I would also point folks to the Tech Equity Collaborative. They have a housing racism, tech bias, and housing initiative. Um, and they actually have laid out some uh, like ethical guidelines for companies that are in this area to think about. So um, that is another resource I think folks can go to. Um, and they're at techequitycollaborative.org. And Privacy Rights Clearinghouse, I believe, is, well, actually, privacyrights.org. So yeah. Always happy to plug our other uh, nonprofit partners. I would also partners. like to say, um, wherever it's written on, can oh, yeah. we go back to the Yep, one sorry. Thing? No. Oh. Just so I know what my link said. Um, where is it? There it is. Yes, so if you were to look for, um, thank you. Landlord Tech Watch. It's a mapping system that I thought was really, really cool because. Um, We've seen a lot of maps and people all over the world will put things in and then we get a, you know, a user participated kind of picture of what's going on. Um, I participated in this. Uh, there were some students that were doing this and somehow and over the last several years I stumbled into it and I thought it was a great project. They're trying to get it going. And you answer some questions and you uh, on a form and they're compiling data and they are populating a map of what kind of surveillance technologies are being used in your community. I did it. I thought it was great. Um, and I wanted to see what it would look like if it were growing because um, 
you know, when you're trying to do something for free, I don't get paid to do any of this. Uh, no lobbying. I've never been paid to do anything. I just am interested, as many other people that are a advocates of a cause or activists are. And I said, well, boy, if they fill this thing out enough, then we'll get an idea of, like, what it's like in places, you know, we, we don't live. Um, so I would encourage you to uh, participate in that if you if that sounds like something that you, you would be interested in doing. Um, and also, I was mad about one thing, so it gave me instant satisfaction that I could say, like, you did that and that and that. And I put, you know, put this place on the map, you know, and I said, okay, so it's, I can go back and look. Like, that's that landlord that did that, you know. And there's a little satisfaction sometimes in those things. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Um, well, I think, should, shall we open up for questions? Do yes, and I will do my them? best to answer whatever it is. All right. Um, <laughs> Hi, um, I was just wondering, uh, you did mention interconnectivity between devices. How would that also apply to work? Because everything that you mentioned with the smart locks is in, in my work building in West Midtown. So like, how would that apply to what I need to be concerned about on my way in and out of work? Sorry if that made no sense, I'm exhausted. No, I think it does, <laughs> but I don't know if your sense is what I picture when you say that. Are you asking a question that means you are now working from home as our societies have evolved? Is that what you're saying? I do work from home, but like my building itself, it has a smart lock, the, the recognition to get into the parking garage, like everything's on lockdown and they're like knowing exactly where you're going all the time. So is that location data also like the tenant data so this is not a residential building you're not no. talking in that space you're speaking more of uh, an office building. yeah okay so where that gets different for me uh is the fact that um we're talking today that you're, you're not off topic it's simply <laughs> we're talking about something that's affecting us at home in our residences you certainly do have uh, you have the right and you it's legit and I'm on your side that there's concerns but the concerns will be concerns that would be addressed through uh, you know the landlord the building owner and the people are actually contracting um, the space where you work so your employer would be one of those you know individuals or companies you know what I'm saying uh, the concern that we're talking about today isn't addressing that although that is a concern because when I have a lease and it's between myself and my landlord that's where I was concerned about those uh, things I have not raised a concern about some place I've worked and I work residentially in people's homes mm -hmm. um, but I respect them as homeowners and property owners and it's their private property and I'm interested in it but I'm not going to go and tell someone who owns land what they're supposed to do um, because I don't have the right to do that in the same way that I can say that about what I'm trying to accomplish at my home like I don't want that thermostat <laughs> I'd like to have the option to say that but if my employer or even if as a contractor wants to do that, then um, I either accept that, I mean, that's kind of the way I look at it, or that I get another job, get yeah. a different contract, because you know, I don't want to do that. Yeah, and I to would a say, degree, to a degree. I would say, I mean, you're absolutely right that a lot of these technologies are present in offices, and I think, um, you know, we talked about like user autonomy and control. It's even harder in a workplace environment, right? Because you've, um, in many ways, even even less control over what's happening. Um, but I think, you know, those are certainly issues you you can raise with your employer. Um, I think, you know. Uh, in terms of data collection and surveillance, particularly surveillance and facial recognition and things like that, you know, that's come up a lot in um, my previous panel was on, on unionizing in, in, uh, in tech shops, but like that's a, that's a thing that has come up a lot, right? Data surveillance in the workplace and um, just sort of trying to think about, you know, in this new world, how are we able to protect that information and what kind of control are we able to exercise over it? It, it is a lot of the same data collection, but it is actually a much more complex uh, area. Cool. So, Thank you. Thanks for your question. You mentioned at the very beginning uh, right to repair um, as part of this, and you might not be aware of them and they might not be aware of you. you. You might move in very different circles. But for farming, that's a huge, that's multi, you know, hundred millions, billions of dollars. Because mm -hmm. a lot of farm equipment sold nowadays, you don't have the right to repair or you're fighting for the right to repair. Sure. Can you speak to how this touches on that? 
I mean, that's a great question. I was actually also on the right to repair panel a couple days ago. Or was that? Yeah. Anyway, I don't I know what day it is. Night. Was it yesterday? She <laughs> did it, and it was a great panel. Um, I mean, I think a lot of this gets to, um, like, sort of philosophically, like, a broader question about, like, what is ownership and what is ownership versus access and what is, like, uh, like what is the autonomy, again, that we have over the, the products that we have. Um, it's funny, I'd actually never really thought about the the relationship between right to repair and, and prop tech in particular. Um, but I do think they are thematically connected in that in that autonomy sense. Um, sorry, I kind of got, what was the question? <laughs> I got away from the question. Right. Um, I mean, right. So. Uh, well, it was really a right to repair question. Which is? A right to repair. <laughs> which you cannot do. I mean, I suppose you could not uh, repair your own smart lock probably in your home. You could not put it in the... Uh, sorry, I'm oh, just trying to oh, relate them together a little bit. That's what I was doing too. Okay, so that's a good one. I can do that. <laughs> no, I got it. You gave me the picture. Um, so that would mean you would be interacting with something that would have been provided. So that's everything from, you know, everybody, you screwed the curtains into the wall. Now you have to, you, you can't remove it anymore. Everybody's seen that language that's ever lived in an apartment. You know, once you put it up, you can't take it down kind of thing because they say that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what they say anymore, but I mean, I've seen that since I was like yeah. 18. Uh, and uh, so it would probably be this was something provided by the property owner mm -hmm. and I don't think you would have a lot of, it doesn't sound like you'd have a lot of rights there, you know? I, I yeah. mean, it, I think it, for me, it sounds like, are you, if the gentleman back there, um, I'm thinking more in the way you ask that, uh, can I take that down? Can I remove that? Is that kind of the direction? I'm talking about, you have a tractor. Yes. Right. Tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars spending, and you don't have the right to repair. Sure. Okay, that definitely is a different question that was on the other panel, yeah. and it's true. And there, there are people here in the Georgia legislature that are interested in doing a right to repair bill. I do not know whether or not it addresses that, but agriculture is the committee that there were some interest. I remember this part, and then the pandemic was happening, and we didn't get further with it, so it may be something that yeah. um, I'm sure it is a factor. Um, I don't know who who's going to lobby. John Deere will come, and all of these other people probably. <laughs> yeah, we can talk about that on a, a yeah. different. I do think, though, one thing that it is it echoes between the two, right? So, a, a, a lot of the times when we're talking about right to repair and tractors, it's that you need an authorized repair person to come in, and you have to wait. And um, you know, often timing is very important in farming, and so it's like not good for for waiting. I think if uh, one of these devices broke, you would also probably have to have somebody authorized to come and repair it, and that could also have have consequences, especially if you're talking about smart locks, which control, controls access to your um, to your apartment or you know, access to your home. So, um, I think there are some right to repair issues that that cross over and, and certainly echo each other. Yes, agreed. Hello. Hi. So, um, you know, I I live somewhere currently where it's one of you know the many large companies that owns a lot of different properties. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the one that I happen to be at, for whatever reason, ha doesn't seem yet, at least, to quite have, um, you know, jumped totally on the bandwagon. But, like, a lot of their other properties, even, you know, within that same company, um, have a lot of the technology um, with different, you know, fobs or apps for the smart locks and stuff like that. Um, but have you guys seen you know, where any of those larger companies are really receptive at all, where like, you know, if you're looking to move on to this place, it's one of these huge sort of faceless companies, you know, um, and it's got all these things and you're like, well, can I not, <laughs> you know, have this? I mean, are, you know, have you seen where the comp, you know, people have really had any luck with that or is it really just more for the time being of trying to, um, you know, find a, a place if you can, that just maybe doesn't have as many of the, those features. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, thanks for the question. I think um, 
in a lot of cases, this is an area where we're doing a lot more education work right now, right? I mean, I think people see the value of the convenience of some of these products, but they're not necessarily thinking about the data privacy. I think that's certainly true of the property management companies as well, right? They see an opportunity to make money, but they aren't really thinking through what does a privacy conscious policy look like? So um, I think there's certainly, you know, I've, I've had conversations with my landlord about what are other options. I think, Chuck, you have a, a, also a personal anecdote about that as well, don't you? I, I was trying to imagine. Uh, I, I feel what you're saying because I have yet to move into a place where I have to have the thermostat. Um, but I'm just kind of old school. Like I just want, you know, the Hunter Douglas and I want a battery backup and it work goes up and down and well, I'm good with that. And, but I, and I don't know what they would do, but I've kind of started to think how would I approach them or would I approach them? Would I just unhook the other one since I know how to do it and put the other one up and then right. wait, you know, because, um, Ultimately, it might not be that big of a deal, but sometimes in this kind of space, I like to just do things, you know, to kind of see, like, is anybody monitoring that? Are they coming to ask me about it? But can they tell that I've unhooked it? Because I'm interested in that because that's part of the reason I'm mad in the first place. It's <laughs> like, right. is that actually, are you coming? Do you know that? <laughs> you know, like that. And if it isn't, then it might be, you know, like, I want to put a ceiling fan in. You know, okay, you can. They'll let you, or you actually have to call the maintenance person to do that because they don't want you to do that. But if it's like that, that's one set of things, right? But if it's something like, well, I didn't want to have that anymore, so now I'm, uh, well, how did you know I didn't report that? If that's what happens, then I'd like to, I'd like to know. <laughs> that's, a, that's a different level for me. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, hopefully this is relatable, but uh, most modern hotels use card keys. Mm -hmm. And in the early days, I was told by a family member to not return the cards because there was personal information stored on the card. Wondering if that's possibly true. And some of the newer hotels use apps mm -hmm. on the phone using Wi-Fi. Is that uh, signal encrypted so somebody with a sniffer can... Um, pick that information up through the, the Wi-Fi sniffer and possibly get personal information. So I will say that about the app. So one of the concerns that people have with apps is that every single one that you download is another opportunity for there to be an attack in the first place because your attack surface has increased. That may be a little more broad than you would think, I mean, about this, but on another point, uh, every app that you download is another opportunity for some third-party data collection. So if that's something that you're, you know, feeling passionate about, then yes, that is a concern in that. As far as um, what does that mean uh, in a hotel situation, of course, you don't have to stay at those hotels. So, I mean, they're probably going to push back on that type of thing. As far as, like, the, the cards that people have, the key card type things that you use, um, my concern about that is not nearly as as uh, alarming as it would be if I were entering my home and something didn't work because at a hotel you should be able to find someone and be able to gain entry. But if I need to take my medicine and it is a, a, something that needs to go in a refrigerator and I can't get in there and I have only a window of time to take it, then that's not going to be cool for me. And there's a lot of scenarios that I've come up with like that that are a little problematic. If I live in a place, and it sounds like it ought to be modern with this kind of device and I have to do all of this, but I can't see my lock easily and I think someone's following me or whatever the situation is, I know how to get in or I know how to hold those keys and bam, if I have to. There's all kinds of things people have been taught over the years. No one knows what to do when you hold a card <laughs> and somebody's coming after you. <laughs> I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm yeah, fascinated, though. That you either. think like I do. <laughs> yeah. I wish I had a definitive answer. That's, it, it's, it's not a crazy thing to be thinking, in my opinion, but I don't no. know the answer. Yeah. Uh, have you all heard about the case of this Brandon Jackson just a couple months ago who was basically locked out of his house and all of his devices in his house because uh, everything was adjudicated through Alexa? And uh, he was falsely accused of having made a racist comment over an Alexa device and locked out, all, out, of, out of his house, essentially, for a week. 
the last part I've and now that you say yeah. the name and the connotation, but yeah. I didn't know that it had anything to do with you know being locked out on the devices. Well, he couldn't yeah. access his Amazon, right? They fro froze his Amazon account. They did, yeah. But also a lot of his devices were on it, so he right, right, right. Yeah, use his smart home at all. Yeah. So, sort of a cautionary tale related to this. Yeah. Thank you. So I had two questions, if you don't mind. Um, the first one, I was curious about what positive evolutions you've seen that have worked for smart tech between landlords and tenants, and ideally something that excluding just hoping a company decides randomly to stop privacy tracking. So something that you really see happening right now versus hoping for change. Um, the other one is, I was curious of ways you've seen landlords use smart tech to call out lease violations on tenants, if you've seen any of those. Mm -hmm. uh, I can say I have not seen anybody that was um, active in, uh, because it partly, probably, I'll try to be an advocate for the real estate people too, like <laughs> probably because it's newer, they haven't, uh, you know, been advocating for we don't want that. Mm -hmm. I've, I've not experienced it. I, yeah. All I saw where I was living and around me were different, you know, solutions being developed and those being the next ones to be adopted. So I felt like this was a very good time, and I wish I had already been in the space thinking about it. Uh, but that's the funny thing about technology. You know, it happens to us is what, is, what really is, it is. And then we discover, oh, that's what the new, the new thing. Unless you're in the industry, and I'm not specifically in that development industry, so I wouldn't have known that I was about to get hit with, you know, the solutions that were coming. So that's kind of how I look at that uh, because uh, I've, not, I've not seen that. I have had on the inverse pushback from questioning them and that's also intimidating to people um, because you have to practice you know going and asking your landlord how is this being stored you know and also realizing many of the people you'll speak to will be at this level and the solution that you're looking at the answer for is somewhere else at a corporate headquarter probably or something like that and they're not actually going to know it they in right. in they you you may get the canned answer if you're lucky right. or you may get just nothing out of that at all what was the first part well so the first part so yeah, that first yeah, question yeah. was I actually, did it backwards I'm sorry well the first part was the question you were answering okay but it was kind of like what is just like kind of set it and forget it no one has to worry about how it's stored because frankly most landlords that are just private landlords they won't know this either Right. And they're not thinking about this. So what are certain technologies that people are like, okay, just go get this. This will work. Everyone's happy. Don't have to worry about it. Because I would have thought keyless is great, right, and all that stuff. So, But now I'm hearing it's maybe not so much. Well, I, I mean, this is my opinion of how mm -hmm. this is how I feel about these things. Um, I think where the solution ultimately lies is in all of us advocating, as, they, as we are, many of us, for... Um, some real uh, guidance for what data collection should be. Right. And some states have uh, enacted more you know, specific laws about that. Haley knows all kinds of things about state legislation. But I think that's where, you know, because it's a big umbrella and then there's niche that's underneath it. So the same things will apply in many different spaces. And so as much as I wish I could just say, I'm going to do all of this and then I'll figure out the housing, it's really not going to be that way because there's the same things are being used in automotive and the same things are being used everywhere. So it's not going to be the one solution that I'm looking for. Sure. And like I think you were kind of going in that direction also. Um, I wish I could say I'm looking for positive things. The positive thing is that I think it's very cool when people come up with tech solutions because tech usually means that we're employing ourselves here a lot of times, you know, and I like that Georgians are getting jobs and I like Georgia companies and I like Georgia solutions. I like all of those things. I just want to have more conversation with people that aren't in that uh, and, and then, you know, and look for the positives so that we can amplify those. And I think many people would say, wow, there's going to be some really great things in the future if we were able to say, well, when I leave this space, I don't have to be there anymore. I can actually leave because this is a situation where possibly uh, for the first time in human 
society or history that we we would live in a a, a culture where um, when I leave my apartment and I now go somewhere else and live, that I'm actually not gone because I'm still there because somebody still has some latency left over digitally of me. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. that, that's different. Um, and I don't want that showing up in the future and affecting me with unintended consequences on my credit reports or in um, any other way that people are going to use data to measure, you know, who we are. Like life is um, scored by a computer nowadays. Right. <laughs> And so uh, the second question was about landlords using smart tech to actually kind of play. It's not like play like that cat gotcha game mm-hmm. a little bit uh, to tenants. Is that actually a thing that they're using smart tech for that? or how's So that- I, I think mostly where I've seen it is in the tenant screening um, question, yeah. right? And so uh, a lot of times when we're automating things that, you know, uh, you see the just the discriminatory patterns that existed already in that industry being amplified when you're when you're automating it. And I think that is mostly where I've seen it. And certainly we have seen a lot of um, fair housing advocates, for example, start to pay more attention to, to this kind of technology and particularly how, for example, face recognition might be used in something like government housing. So I think that's mostly where the conversation is right now. I haven't necessarily seen it moved as much into, into private spaces, but um, I certainly have a lot of concerns about it, right? I mean, when we're talking about home data, that's some of our most intimate data about, you know, sort of when we're home, who we're with, uh, who's going in and out of places and at what times. And so um, a lot of what we were, we wanted to do this panel is just to sort of um, raise the alarm, right? Put up the flag on that. So, okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So I have two questions. So um, are there anything legal issues that we could do uh, like if we're tenants to say that, you know, are we legally allowed to change our locks, to change our thermostats, to make them unsmart or regular? Um, uh, and also li- light bulbs as well. I mean, there's li- lighting. I don't think anyone spoke of lighting. So that's one, the second question I have is there, um, in lease agreements, do they have to disclose what apps you have to use in order to, to live there? Yeah, so I think um, uh, I think that varies wildly by uh, by municipality, by state, um, by tenants' rights laws. I'm actually not. I don't know what the notice requirements are um, for for smart you know, for smart devices. I'm guessing that um, this. I should have said this much earlier. I'm not a lawyer, but um, I would guess. You know, I haven't I haven't seen it. I haven't heard of that. So I'm guessing that there's not probably a, a, a requirement of notice. Um, a lot of this would fall under consumer data privacy law, so um, you know, particularly things like right to delete and stuff like that. So um, we might see that come up more in the future, but I haven't seen it yet. So, so what about? Uh, so I guess we you don't know if we're legally allowed to change or have the right to change our thermostat. I think I mean. So in my last apartment, so not the one that made me download all the apps, but in the last apartment. Um, you know, it, it, unfortunately, it comes down, I think, a lot to individual advocacy. So in my last apartment, they were converting to Nest thermostats, for example. And I said, well, is there a way that I can not yeah, yeah. do this? Um, and they, you know, they, they let me do that because I was an existing tenant. So I think, unfortunately, it falls a lot on the individual at this point. Yeah, that was my motivation for wanting to be participate in this type of discussion in the first place, is that it is being adopted and solutions are being offered to um, communities and uh, or they're advertised as solutions. But regardless, um, there's not enough information yet. And uh, so the, uh, the glass half full of that is that this is a great time for us to like start talking about what we would yes. like to have. Um, uh, we won't talk about it if they can come up with housing affordability for everybody. And then we'll all go back to our private property and argue over Fourth Amendment and those kind of things. But until then, and we're like stuck having to live, you know, in these kind of communities, I think it's a perfectly great thing to be talking about because you might be living there, you know, like me for 30 years. Years. <laughs> and my question is sort of on that vein. I have a separate Google account for my phone and my personal stuff. Mm-hmm. Isolating the different parts of your digital life, is that futile or does it actually help? I mean, there's so many things I'm not. I'm not a technologist either, right? But I think, you know, certainly we talk, when we're talking generally about good practices, um, you know, kind of segmenting off information. So I actually do that for, I have an apartment 
only email address. Now, I'm not saying it's perfect, right? But it is my sort of way of saying like, okay, I don't want it to mix with this and this. And, and you know, obviously I access them all from the same device. So it's a question of like, maybe they can associate those accounts. But I think in terms of, it's so hard sometimes in privacy work because I feel like we raise a lot of a lot of concerns and then I'm like, and there's nothing you can do about it. Sorry, um, but that is one thing. You, I mean, I think segmenting is is a is a good idea. I don't know that it's the perfect solution, but I think it's it is a good idea. I'm with you. I don't. I I do that. I like segmenting too. I think it is an organizing tool. It's a good idea. Uh, or at least for me, it's helped out. I cannot give you the tech answer in terms of like um, how things are linked together. I would have to defer to my systems administrator over here that is my friend <laughs> if I really wanted a more detailed answer on that. But I, I think uh, segmentation is smart because, um, well, I mean, for the reasons that you're doing it too, probably. Like it's practical, you know, if something isn't working right here, you can always migrate and make a change and you've not lost everything all at once, you know. I mean, that's why I do it. And I also do it because um, I know that we're more increasingly linked together in terms of like our different profiles of doing things. But at the same time, um, I've had some pretty good success at keeping, you know, kind of like business this way and home, you know, this way. And, and so that so that I don't get them muddled because I'm not going to live there forever and I want to make my bills come to a place that is you know protected and I don't have to worry about that being a problem uh, where you know like the coupons that I'm g given to go to a store and all of the things that other people have like I don't care I don't want those mixed in I want that on that address and if I lose it I'm not going to cry over it that type of thing and I, I think uh, it's anecdotal, but I mean, I do think that it, it helps. I do personally think it helps to keep things separated like that. Is that what you do? I mean, is that why you're doing it? Well, yeah, I work at a cell phone repair place, and I've seen customers, both Android and Apple, where one account got hacked and then everything got hacked. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I mean, we work. live in that world. Yeah. Right. Right. It's like we have our own backup systems that we make up that way. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you all for joining us, and you've made it. Congratulations, DragonCon 2023 in much the books.